in Missoula, but moved to Boise, Idaho in the early 1980s, where she worked in museum and nonprofit management for over 30 years. She holds a master's degree in nonprofit management and is a certified fundraising manager from Indiana University School, sorry, Univer Indiana University Lilly School of Philanthropy. Lisa has served on several nonprofit boards and has also served as a trustee for several nonprofit foundations. In 2016, Lisa moved home to Montana after accepting the position as Executive Director for the National Museum of Forest Service History. She has a love for history instilled in her childhood from her parents, who would regularly take the family to history museums and historical places. She enjoys spending time with her family and her two giant St. Bernards. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. I'm just curious to know whenever I start one of these talks, how many people have been to the National Museum of Forest Service History to our campus? Okay, good, about half of the group. How many of you that haven't been to the campus, are, were you aware of the museum before tonight? Yep. Okay, great. Well, as you may know, we have a wonderful campus out on Highway 10 West just about a mile west of the airport, but we are, have been raising money for a long time for a brand new facility here in the Missoula area, a world-class museum to showcase conservation history. And I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about that and our progress that we've made. And then I'm gonna turn it over to our curator and historian for the museum, Dave Stack, who's going to give you a great presentation on some Missoula history. So you can go ahead and go to the next slide, Dave. So our organization is a little over 30 years old. We have a national board of directors uh, that are dispersed all over the United States. Uh, despite our name, we are not funded by the US Forest Service. We are an organization that works to support the history, the dissemination of history, the collection of history for the agency and for all of its partners and for the, the basically the conservation history of the United States. Organizations around the United States, like our regional director cadres, which share our museum's work in regions all around the United States. And then we have a number of historians that assist us in our work. We have a large artifact collection, and we have offices and repository right now in Midtown Missoula. And so while we've been raising money for our National Conservation Legacy Center, we also do a number of other types of outreach work. We do exhibits, traveling exhibits, virtual exhibits. We help other museums with their exhibits. We curate exhibits for companies such as Filson and their flagship stores in Seattle and New York. We also do a lot with education. We work with the Library of Congress to hold teacher workshops where we bring teachers from all over the country to Montana to learn about conservation history, to write lesson plans, and then they become ambassadors for the museums back in their communities. And all of their lesson plans and all of their work is available at no cost to anyone that would like to access it through our website. We also have on-site field days for local schools, and we host events. One of our most popular events is an old-fashioned Forest Service Christmas that we hold every year the Saturday after Thanksgiving. We have Santa and his pack team. We have, it's a very educational driven event, so we have a lot of different activities for kids. We have campfire stories. Um, we have over a thousand people that attend that. It's all free of charge to the public. All of our events are. We also have book signings and lectures. And so we have a lot of things going on. Uh, now we mentioned our campus. So our campus is about 31 acres, and again, it's about one mile west of the Missoula Airport. Right now, it's open Memorial Day through Labor Day. We have a historic ranger's cabin, which someday in the future will serve as an exhibit, uh, but of what, of what it was like to live as a ranger and their family on a remote district uh, back in the 30s and 40s. But today, it serves as a visitor center, small gift shop, and then we also have a beautiful interpretive trail with all kinds of outdoor exhibits um, and signage to kind of, uh, for people to walk around and enjoy. And then we also have a beautiful timber frame amphitheater and stage where we hold our events. Next slide. 
So, you know, our organization, as I mentioned, is 30 years old. And about uh, 12 years ago, we started working on a capital campaign to raise money to build a brand new facility here in the Missoula area. And uh, we worked very hard on that campaign, expecting that there would be a federal appropriation to help fund the build, and that never came. But we have a very dedicated uh, board of directors and group of volunteers. We never gave up on this project, and now we are about to complete our capital campaign. So we're very excited. This project is going to happen. It's no longer a question of if it happens now, it's when. And so we started working with a world-renowned architect because we wanted to have a new type of building design. We wanted to feature mass timber, innovative wood products, Montana wood products, and wood products of the Northwest. And we really wanted to make this building an exhibit in and of itself. So I'm going to show you some images of our new design, but I'm also going to show you this campus master plan because we have a lot of future amenities that we'll be bringing to the campus. Um, so some of which include a P2V aerial tanker from Neptune Aviation, which we'll be installing this summer, and that will serve as an aerial fighter fight, or firefighting uh, exhibit with uh, interpretive signage. We'll also have um, an outdoor uh, kind of uh, picnic area. We'll have a Smoky Bear Playhouse and a Woodsy Owl Treehouse for kids in the future, and then we'll also have a live animal mule barn where we can have demonstrations of packing, and then we'll have a mule ride loop so that anyone that comes and visits can get on a mule and see what it, and feel what it was like to be a ranger in the remote areas of our wilderness. And then the Conservation Legacy Center will be the anchor for our campus. Next slide. So this is just gives you kind of a, a, render, a rendering of our new building design. You can see those kind of tree-like columns that support the uh, mass timber roof. We'll go on to the next slide. We'll talk about those. Um, so I mentioned we're using a lot of innovative wood products in our building. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do was to create a practitioner study of using some of these new and innovative wood products, many of which were uh, developed or some of the research for the development of these was conducted by the Forest Products Lab in Madison, Wisconsin. How many of you have heard about mass timber or cross-laminated timber? Okay, so a few of you. So if you're unfamiliar with that product, it is a product that can really help contribute to the health of our forests because it uses small diameter timber to create uh, large scale, very strong wooden panels. And they're actually building skyscrapers out of this type of material, but it's made of wood. It's not made of extracted materials, so it helps sequester carbon. It's really a part of the future for climate change. And we wanted to embrace that and be a part of that. So next slide. So in addition to the uh, work that we've been doing with the building, we've simultaneously been working with a world-class exhibition design firm because we really wanted this to be a world-class facility and that meant not just the building, that also meant the exhibits. We designed the building to have a certain wow factor because we wanted people to see it when they fly in from the airport, when they're driving by in the interstate. We wanted it to be a building that drew attention to itself so that people would say, wow, what is that? I want to come and see that. But we also wanted to have leading edge exhibits. Uh, there are no, no types of exhibitry or a facility like this anywhere in the region. And we wanted to really be that national destination for conservation history. And so we started working with a firm called Art Processors. They're actually based in uh, Australia. But we chose them particularly because, first of all, they have a great track record in the United States. They've done museums such as the 9-11 Museum, the Getty Center, the Holocaust Museum. But they really use uh, technology, a mix of technology and static displays to tell the stories. They're master storytellers. And we knew we were going to need technology in this new design because when you think of the history of conservation, it is so multifaceted and it is so deep. Every single piece of, of, of this facet tells many, many, many interesting and wonderful stories. And how do we create exhibits 
that not only appeal to the general public who don't know anything about conservation history, or and how do we also appeal to history buffs like yourselves that may have a really strong knowledge of a specific aspect of conservation history. So by a mix of innovative, uh, submersive, and participatory exhibits using technology and static displays is how we are going to accomplish this task. So next slide. These are just some images of the exhibition area. Uh, we have a full deck just on this part of the building alone, so we're not going to talk about that a lot today, but I wanted to just share with you some of what you'll see when you come to the Conservation Legacy Center. Next slide. So as I mentioned, um, we're, we've made a lot of progress, and we're actually over 85% of our original goal now. Uh, with a large donation that just came in last week. We had a $1.5 million uh, estate gift that we received. Um, so we're well on our way. Our estimated timeline right now is to complete our schematic design and our construction documents, which is about a nine-month process. We're going to be doing that this year. We'll be also finalizing our capital campaign and preparing for construction. We plan to break ground and start construction next year and then with an opening in 2024. So that's our current timeline. Again, the caveat with that is just based on you know, ongoing fundraising and any um, uh, unknowns in the construction costs, which is a very volatile world right now. So now we're going to give you a brief uh, fly-through of our new campus and our new building. There we go. So I'll go ahead and narrate this for you. So here we are coming in off of Highway 10 West. Some of what you see here is already in place. You can come and visit it this summer. Uh, but as you drive down our, uh, our driveway, here you'll see the uh, P2V aerial tanker that's being installed this summer on the right. And now as we pull up to the Conservation Legacy Center, you'll see a large orientation plaza, which is where school buses can drop off kids, Groups can gather, um, and people can be dropped off in this area. And then we're going to drive down to our parking area. Now, straight in front of us here to the south is, at the end of our campus, is the end of the Missoula International Airport runway. We plan to have a large gathering area in front of the Conservation Legacy Center to the south. So, an area for events, an area for people to gather and enjoy. Walking up to the lobby of the center, we'll have two lobby entrances, one on the south and one on the east side of the building. So here we are walking up to the south entrance. I mentioned earlier these tree-like columns. They're really unique and special because each one is constructed of a species of wood that represents national forests all across the United States and Puerto Rico. And these will be heavy timber frame joinery, so all beautiful handmade timber frame joinery like our James B. Ewell Pavilion, if you've been out to our site and seen our beautiful stage. So here we are in the lobby. This big empty room that you see, that's actually the exhibition hall. We have a separate fly-through for that area, but this is a, a fly-through that was developed by the architectural firm, so it focuses on the features of the building. Um, here we have a south-facing corridor, interior corridor. You can see some of the areas, such as the bathrooms and storage in this area. Again, uh, mass timber walls, which is a beautiful wood product, solid wood, uh, Douglas fir. We'll have a small gift shop that you exit um, as you leave the exhibition hall. We'll have two rooms that can be used as classrooms. They can be made into one large room. They can be used for uh, meetings or for uh, fundraising events or other types of events as well. And then we currently have our offices and repository in Midtown Missoula, and all of this will be moved to the Conservation Legacy Center once it's built. So we just saw the office space. Here we have an outdoor patio large grassy area, uh, again to the south of the building, and then going down the exterior uh, south-facing corridor, you see more of these beautiful 
tree-like support columns for the cross-laminated timber roof structure. And then we're going to be walking around to the east side of the building and entering from the orientation plaza into the uh, lobby. And you'll see a large circular feature that's in the center of this lobby area that will be our uh, information desk and missions desk. And then we'll be going down in the elevator to our repository area. As I mentioned earlier, we have a very large collection of artifacts, objects, uh, historic documents, photographs. And so we will be having uh, our repository in this facility as well. Each of these rooms that you see will feature different environmental controls to, that will support and, and protect whatever the artifacts we may have in that particular room would be. We'll also have a small exhibit fabrication facility in this part of the building, and then we'll have some staff parking and large vehicle access to be able to bring in and out exhibits and our larger objects. Then going back up into the elevator, we're going to go into a mezzanine level, and this is actually a level that we realized we could finish and use. It's directly above the classrooms and the gift shop and the public restrooms below. So we will finish this area. We haven't identified what that will be used for yet. It could be a meeting space, library space, staff space. Uh, we'll find a use for it, maybe more exhibit space. And then taking the elevator up to the roof deck, We'll have a beautiful roof deck with viewing platforms so you can look out over the campus. And we'll also have an ADA accessible lookout exhibit. We currently have a really nice L4 lookout exhibit on our Discovery Trail, but that lookout is not ADA accessible, so people can just access it by uh, looking at it from the outside. So this will have a fully accessible lookout exhibit. And then we'll just kind of pan out and you'll be able to kind of get an overview of the building and the campus. We'll also have large vehicle access into the main exhibit hall so we can bring in all of the components that we'll need for that part of the building. And at some point I'll have to come back because we can do a whole presentation just on the exhibition as well. And I can show you a fly through of the exhibition space. So that is our, kind of our project and where we are right now with our project. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dave Stack now, who is going to uh, show us the fly through again. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, Dave has a fantastic presentation on some of the local history that I think you'll really enjoy. Dave has been with the museum for a really long time. I sometimes call Dave the glue because he has held the museum together for literally decades. Dave is a Forest Service retiree, retired here in Region 1, and he is our curator and historian, and I can honestly say I've never met anyone that knows Forest Service history more than Dave does. He is a wonderful wealth of information, and I'm happy to work with him. Thank you, Lisa. It's great here to be here tonight to spend a small amount of time talking about forest conservation and the uh, the role of the Forest Service. You know, it's really, uh, a, we're a national museum. We want to emphasize that. We're a national, even world. There's a lot of activities that occurred in uh, foreign countries that the Forest Service supported and worked with other foreign uh, forestry organizations across the world. But tonight, I wanted to spend time on talking about how the uh, Missoula community and the Forest Service has grown up and had a long relationship since 1905 with the community. And I think Missoula is a unique community in the United States in that relationship. Uh, when I came uh, to Missoula in 85, believe it or not, I came from West Virginia. They, they said West by God, Virginia. Uh, but I, I spent my 35 years in the Forest Service working in the Lake States, working in West Virginia. I worked a, a summer in California in college, summer in Oregon when I was in college. So I've seen different situations around the country. When I came to Missoula, probably there was about 1,000 Forest Service employees in Missoula at that time. And uh, I would 
think over the century plus that uh, at least half of the families in Missoula living here now had some connection with the Forest Service through their family, whether it was a, a brother, sister, mother, father, worked a, even a season as a firefighter, uh, was a permanent employee or whatever. I think there's so many people that have that connection. Right across the street, there was a university professor. His daughter was on our fire crew on Missoula District for several seasons. And just like many persons like her, she went to college. She came back. Now she's a, a medical doctor in Missoula. And I'm sure there's doctors, lawyers, and all kinds of professional people in Missoula that have had that one or two seasons fighting fires. And, uh, and I think the, the Forest Service families have contributed a lot to the Missoula community, just participating in uh, civic activities. If uh, one family is an example, of the, is the Deedon family, they've contributed all kinds of basketball players to, over the years, so that's one example there. So another example is uh, Norm McLean. He, when he was a kid, and if you ever, I'm sure you watched the movie, he, his father asked him, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I think I'll work for the Forest Service. Well, the Reverend McLean didn't think too much of that. He says, well, that's okay for the summer. But and uh, anyway, I got a good laugh out of that. So anyway, so anyway, so what I wanted to do is uh, first talk about uh, and give several examples of this Missoula connection. Then after that, I, I want to show you how we're going to use our collection. And um, in, in this and uh, tell the history of the people and then give some specific examples how we're, we're going to use. Sitting over there, and I'll, I'll bring it out a little later, is a bell off of the uh, Forest Service Navy up in Alaska, but I'll explain that a little later. Uh, okay, next slide. Okay, the Forest Service uh, office, uh, the regional office opened in 1908. The Forest Service w was established by Congress at the urging of Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot in 1905. The regional office came to Missoula in 1908. And this is a, a, a photograph of s some of the uh, early forest supervisors and uh, in, in, the, uh, in front of the, uh, the building downtown, former federal building. Next slide. Of course, the, the, nat the Forest Service uh, manages uh, the National Forest. Uh, and in 1898, the Forest Reserve, under the Department of Interior, the General Land Office, the Bitterroot Forest Reserve was established. And then in 1906 and 1905, more forests were created. The, the Lolo, the Missoula, uh, and the Hellgate, just some of those forests right around. In addition, there's the Flathead and the Deer Lodge and all the other forests. Um, and you see this, the photograph here is uh, Ranger Griffin standing uh, on a mountain uh, on a ridge top overlooking the forest. And that photograph was taken uh, near Thompson Falls. And if you look closely at the, at least on the original photo, uh, photograph, you can see the different uh, fire patterns on the landscape. Okay, next slide. Another organization that the uh, Forest Service has had close uh, relationship with is the university. This photograph is taken around 1920 on the steps of the, the old main of some uh, rangers and I believe students. And uh, next slide. Okay, this is a picture of the fire warehouse where when they had a fire, they loaded up the trucks and hauled the bedrolls and Pulaski's and everything else out to the fire. Believe it or not, this building was located, if you can picture it, between the courthouse and the city hall. 
downtown. That's where this building was. Now it's a parking lot on there. But this is a, in the early 1920s of photograph. Next photo. This is a photograph of a Ford tri-motor and a smoke jumper preparing to exit a, a perfectly good airplane and parachute out. And uh, Johnson Flying Service provided uh, aircraft services for the uh, Forest Service for many, many years, starting at Hale Field. If you ever look on the red skies of Montana, there's a short, there's a short section in the, the movie that shows Hale Field, also shows you the South Hills, with about the only thing up on the South Hills is the small radio building that's a park now along uh, uh, the, the street up there, so on Whitaker. So, uh, next slide. Forest Service research. When we talk about the Forest Service, most of the publicity goes to the National Forest System. And a lot of people describe the Forest Service as kind of like a three-legged stool. The National Forest System is the largest part, but then there's the Forest Service research. And in this photo, you see uh, Bob Marshall. You see uh, Harry uh, Gisborne. He's sort of the father of fire science that was based here in, in, in Missoula. And so these are some of the early fire researchers. And then on the right is Jack Burroughs. This is in the fire lab that's uh, out at the airport and in the burn chamber. And uh, this was built in 1961. And so this is probably the date of that. Uh, that uh, next slide. OK, so moving on. Uh, we've worked with the Smithsonian. Uh, several times, and uh, one of the uh, curators we worked with came out and, and talked at one of our uh, national reunions, and the Jim Deutsch uh, basically saw our collection, and he was very impressed with it, and uh, the objects, he, he said, you know, use, objects are used to tell the story, and so we have lots of objects and lots of papers in there, and uh, so we're going to use our objects in our exhibits in order to tell that story. And I brought one here a little later. We'll talk about some more. The fellow on the right is a, a timber sale administrator on the, one of the first large timber sales the Forest Service had in this region, and it's up at Sealy Lake. It was the Big Blackfoot Milling Company uh, in 1907, 50 million board feet. Uh, most of the, or all of the logs were rafted down the Black, Blackfoot River. And some of them were, was retrieved just a few years ago. And uh, we, re, we purchased a few of those logs from the state when they re, pulled them out of the Blackfoot. And several of them had the U.S. brand on the end of the logs. So who knows where they came from, other than that they were, came from the National Forest on that. Next slide. This shows you uh, just a uh, kind of a small sample of the different uh, items we have, a w wide variety of objects, uh, papers, books, uh, maps. We have over a thousand different maps in our in our collection right now. Next, one of the things too that we want is provide access to our archives. Uh, we, one of the ways that we do that is through an online. So about 40,000 of our objects and papers and photographs are accessible online. And this shows you the kind of the, uh, the home page of our online. Next slide. The collection is uh, really has several purposes. One is, you know, it's if we don't preserve these objects and collect them and care for them, they're going to disappear. So that's one of the main purposes we have. The other is uh, we want to collect objects and papers to, so they're a primary source material for researchers to write the history of conservation. And we use them to develop interpretive exhibits. and. Uh, and somebody, uh, it has been said that, you know, if history is, is not written, it's soon forgotten. Next slide. 
So, you know, understanding history, you know, if you don't really understand the, the, the value of something, then you don't, uh, you don't treasure that. Uh, when we want to understand the, uh, the changes that has occurred over time, and one of the interesting thing is how the society has changed and what they value from the, and want from the public lands, but also, you know, how science has changed, how we look at our resource, and how technology has changed over this 100-year period. And so, uh, Teddy Roosevelt says, uh, the more you know about the past, the better prepared you are for the future. Next slide. I want to, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about and interpret in museum is we want to tell through people. And uh, I've got three examples of some stories that I think you'll f find interesting. Next slide. Okay, the first slide, uh, if you, we're going to talk about a site at, uh, at, uh, on US 2 at the Roosevelt, on the Marias Pass. There was a fellow named Bill Morrison. He also had a nickname, Slippery Bill Morrison. He was quite a character. He got out to the west by uh, working on the railroad. And uh, he owned a saloon at Marias Pass. And... Uh, Somehow he got hired the, uh, to be a, um, a employee of the Forest Reserve. And uh, so his responsibility was like a ranger in the Forest Reserve. They hired a significantly propor high proportion of political appointees. They were not professionally trained people. And so... One of the interesting things that they required is, and the Forest Service required this too, up until the mid-60s, is to write a daily diary. You, you were required to write what you did that day and then monthly turn in your diary so it could be checked to make sure that you were earning your money. Well, Bill, with his saloon, he found an easy way to do that he basically opened the front door, walked out on the porch, and and looked over the, uh, the surrounding hills and trees. And then he went in and wrote in his diary, looked over the forest today. And so that was his extent of that. So Bill was quite a guy. Uh, the next slide. Okay, Robert Desmount was a high school kid in New York City in 1944. At his high school, he saw a notice on the bulletin board about the Clearwater National Forest in Idaho needing employees for that summer. Somehow, he convinced his parents to allow him to go by bus to Orfino, Idaho, and work at the Bungalow Ranger Station and thinking about at that time, you know, most people didn't do travel that much during the war. I don't know how, how the people in New York City viewed Idaho if they hardly considered it in the same country. But it, somehow he convinced his parents. And so he got on the bus and, he, and the way he got connected to our museum was is he retired as a New York City firefighter. And... This is about 10 years ago. His, his uh, sons and daughters gave him a laptop computer for Christmas. And so he was experimenting with, with that. And since he worked on the bungalow, he plugged that into the search engine. And bingo, kind of co got connected with our museum because we have the bungalow cabin relocated out at our site. And so that started an exchange of handwritten letters to me. And uh, I got about two or three letters from him. In that handwritten letters, he described his adventures, and which I thought was very interesting. And being an East Coast guy, one of the things he put in his letter was the, they stopped in uh, Butte, had dinner at it there. And since he, he liked oysters, uh, he thought 
he would order some oysters in, in Butte. Only later during the meal did the waitress inform him that these were not quite the same types of oysters as he was expecting. So anyway, and then the next year, he worked the first year on a blister rust control. The next year, he worked as a lookout. And during the summer, he was losing his silverware. And so he got on the, cranked up with the old telephone, called down to the ranger station, talked to the ranger and said, send up more silverware on the next time the packer comes up to deliver food. Ranger kind of chuckled at that, I believe, and said, well, you better check around and see if the pack, right ha pack rat has not borrowed your silverware. And so that's what happened exactly on that. So, okay, the next slide is Gifford Pinchot. Gifford Pinchot was the first American educated forester and became really the proponent of having a forest service and uh, became quite close and friends with Gifford Pinchot. But in 1896, several years before all this happened and with Roosevelt, he got appointed as the uh, secretary of the National Forest Commission that was charged by Congress to go out and, uh, and there was a scientific community assigned to investigate the conditions of the forest, mostly in the West at that time, and report back. Uh, because there, there was no law in existence, there was no ability of the government to manage the forest reserves at that time. So in 1896, uh, there, the commission was gonna meet at Lake McDonald yeah, to get together, but he came, Pinchot came out a month early. He hired a uh, Blackfeet uh, Native American to guide him and hunt. They, he used the word hunt. I don't know what they were hunting in, in sort of in the summer almost. So he came a month early and he spent quite a bit of time over on the east side. And then he hired another guide and they spent time in the swan. He talked about, he spent quite a bit of time in the swan investigating that. And because of that trip through the swan, the Lewis and Clark Forest Reserve was uh, one of the f first established uh, a number of years later. He complained about the mosquitoes. He talked about having to put all of his uh, clothes and guns and things and on a raft and swim across the, the river. And then because they had to go meet the Forest Reserve Commission at... Uh, Belton and go up to Lake McDonald, they had to exit and get back there. And so over about a 24 hour period, they, they hiked quite a few miles to uh, Drummond to clear through the, the whole valley and got back there. And there they met and uh, ha had the meeting there. So it, it was quite a, quite a meeting that they had and John Muir's showed up and he did not like, there was an old hotel there where the Lake McDonald Lodge was. And uh, the commission stayed there and Muir was, he really was an official member of it, but Muir and Pinchot basically camped out with their guide outside in tents. So they didn't want to stay in there. Next slide. There's a lot of, a lot of other topics, you know, we could spend, hours and hours talking about many other topics. And this is just a short list of topics that we're, we're gonna be covering in the, in the museum one way or the other. Next slide. One of the important things as professional historians is that we wanna, we wanna tell all sides of controversies. The Forest Service has always encountered controversies because the, one of the reasons is there's really more demand and from the users on all the different resources. And so one of the more difficult things that the agency has to do always is try to balance the different uses. Sometimes mistakes are made. And, uh, and so when we tell these controversies, one of the things that we want to do is tell all sides and we don't want to, we want to, we don't want to come down and say this is the 
this was right or this was wrong. We let people draw their own conclusions after they, they received the information. In the Bitterroot controversy, the terracing in the uh, 60s, that certainly is one of the issues that, that we're going to discuss. Next slide. Another organization that's in Missoula is the Missoula Technology and Development Center that's located out at the airport, too, between the fire lab and our museum site. And they've been instrumental in developing uh, fire shelters and, and lots and lots of other types of equipment. This is a geo uh, cargo carrier that was uh, developed experimentally by the lab in the early 60s. And they, on the left, you see in the picture of that they were testing it up in the rattlesnake. I know almost exactly the place where this is. And years later, the, uh, the one of the prototype machines was still out at the lab and they donated that to us. And uh, there's a automobile museum in Nashville, Tennessee that saw that online and they wanted to display that. This thing weighs about uh, 2,000 pounds. And so they came up and trucked it all the way down to Nashville and it's been on a a five-year loan on that. So, next slide. This, the, the little bobcat, he, all, almost every construction site has those. And interesting enough is the Forest Service worked with a manufacturer to help develop that machine. Uh, and uh, on the right, you see a test. They're going to do a burnover of that fire shelter and also the fire engine uh, to, to see the uh, the response of the fire protection items. Next slide. Another project too that it was impacted Missoula was the during World War II the uh, the manpower that smoke jumpers were became uh, enlisted in the military for the war service. So the Forest Service was really hurting for firefighter smoke jumpers and so one of the possible sources of uh, labor came from the civilian public service conscientious objectors and so at Sealy Lake they there was a, a good number a hundred or more each season they trained them as smoke jumpers also they utilized nine mile and uh, they had a, they were very successful and some of the uh, CPS men stayed in Missoula. One became the owner of Mountain Press over time. So uh, we have significant collection of slides and also uh, archive of their experience. Next slide. This shows the, uh, the original uh, smoke jumper crew out at Camp Paxson in Sealy Lake, posed there on the left. In 1943, I believe that is, and then they had many reunions over the years. And on the right, then, is the families came back in '73. Next slide. Okay, now here's the uh, during the war, access to timber and minerals was important, and and the Italian internees at Fort Missoula helped on a project in the Clearwater National Forest to do a help on the clearing for road construction. So this is a, an example here. One of the, and most of these men, a lot of them came from merchant uh, or cruise liners that were impounded. One of them, I believe, was in the Panama Canal Zone. And so they had a lot of different talents from chefs, you know, uh, to people that were uh, very experienced in doing things. Uh, and they used an old CC camp as their headquarters. And so the superintendent that provided us this history said, we never ate so good. They, the chefs they did a very excellent job. I've got an excellent photograph of the, the barber giving the superintendent a shave in the morning. So the ship's barber. And uh, so that was, that was the example there. So next slide. So now I want to talk about the, uh, the Forest Service Navy. Being an old Navy guy myself, 
anyway. Now the the bell. We just we just acquired this bell last year, and this came from the tan, which is the boat on the bottom right that you see there. It was commissioned in 1908 and served till 1931. Now, Ranger boats were used by the Forest Service in Alaska. At one time, maybe during the 20s or 30s, there, there was a, up to uh, uh, 20-some boats in active uh, service. Now, the Tongass National Forest, which is about uh, 20 million acres in size, is not like a national forest outside of Missoula. You can't ride your horses to too many of the spots. In fact, the uh, there's a figure I saw, there was 11,000 miles of shoreline on the Tongass National Forest. So they use boats to get around. And in fact, in the early days, the, the Coast Guard wasn't even up there if functioning like that. And so the force, these ranger boats were doing some Coast Guard duties. And w one of the stories that we have from that is that there was a young uh, secretary that was assigned to the uh, Portland office, went up to Alaska on a vacation with a friend, and were invited to to board the uh, TAN, uh, the Ranger Boat TAN, and in her s archives or remembrance, she talked about that they were served tea by a Japanese steward. So, so that was kind of an interesting. You wouldn't expect that at all. So, and the upper right corner is a kind of a modern Ranger Boat. They. Tongass had a centennial celebration in 2002, and they had a parade of ranger boats. This was, was in private uh, ownership at the time, but had previously served as a ranger boat for the Forest Service. So all the ranger boats are retired now, and so that transportation is now by helicopter and uh, float planes. Uh, next slide. Whoops, you went the wrong direction. All right. Here's the tan underway, and since I'm an old Navy guy, I got to point out that the jack, jack flag that's flying there at the bow, that's in the U.S. Navy, the jack flag is only flown at the bow when you're at anchor or tied up to a pier. Forest Service didn't get the message back then, so anyway, next slide. So this is the last slide. This is a kind of a uh, fairly new watercolor of a ranger station. So we do have some art in this type of mode. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Any questions? Well, thank you all so much again for coming. Please tell your friends about the museum. Help spread the word. We have a great website, forestservicemuseum.org. You can get a lot of information there. You can become a member of our museum. It's only $30 a year. It's a great deal. We have a wonderful newsletter. And we do have some of our materials, our newsletter, annual report, membership brochures right over here on this table. So please feel free to take some as you leave. And thanks again for coming. <laughs>